As I say, this zip zip is going to be able to oh, he gets one, and this is the bomb. He gets the bomb. It has all he does with the dog. The bomb gets one, though. But as Hi, Gareth. Uh, as you know, I'm Yolanda. Very pleased to meet you. Thank you for meeting with me today to discuss the recent roster changes for the XCC Gaming CSGO team, which, if I'm not mistaken, is called XCC Reborn. Uh, yes, hi there. Yes, yes. Um, we, we did recently, with regards to the roster changes, also change the team name from Inspired to Reborn. Great. So I've read your statement that you have released yesterday, and it seems to be pretty heartfelt, and I can really see that it was quite a devastating blow to you guys to lose three players this far into the year. The players who left would be Carlo, Aiden, also known as Turtle, and Daniel. So tell me how this this came to be. I mean, you said that it was quite out of the blue. So it wasn't something that you anticipated. How How did they drop the bomb? Um, well, firstly, uh, as as a team, the four of us, uh, as I said in the press release, the four, the five of us, other than Dan, um, Dan being the addition of the fifth to the team, um, other than him, we had been together for I think over two years or two years roughly, uh, but we've known each other for keepers about seven years or so now uh, in the gaming community. So we've we've always been very very close. And you know, when the team formed, we were we were struggling to find replacements two years ago, and the team that came together was just a very fiery team. Um, we've we've sort of always been known as a top four side um, on paper, but when it comes to our performances, they've been quite lackluster over the past year or so. So you know, for for me, like I. I take pride in the people that I bring into the team. You know, for me, it's not just the player that comes in with skill. It's it's about the character of the person as well. What what he's like both in and out of the game. I think it's it's very important, especially in the gaming community. You they're few and far between finding those types of players. So so it was it was it was a family. It was it was a very very close team, and um, obviously then when Dan came through. Uh, he was. He's also. We've also known him for the same amount of time because Dan, Carlo, and Aiden are best friends. They've been together for like a hundred years. And um, yeah, so uh, you know, we we had great hopes and aspirations for the team, but um, it, it's uh, well. I'll I'll get to that part on the side now. Um, two weeks ago, Thursday, he uh, Carlo had sent a message to us, um, just saying, look. We thank you for absolutely everything that you've done for us. It was a very personal message uh, to each and every player. Um, but he just said uh, he feels that things aren't working out in the team and they don't really want to um, sort of continue if things aren't going to change in a sense. So, so it was kind of a message saying, like, we really appreciate absolutely everything you've done for us. Um, but we we leaving now, so there wasn't sort of any like, let's try change this, let's try change that, or, or anything of that sense. So that's why it was it was quite a big blow for us, um, and I didn't really communicate too much after that because I didn't want to sort of be emotional about the situation. Um, but yeah, it it was it was quite quite heartfelt. Um, it was quite deep as well, considering other than sort of really DC, uh, we we are pretty much the the team that stayed together for the longest. Um, DC obviously being together for I think what 15 years or something, 17 years or something like that. A lifetime, so yes. Yeah, yeah, a lifetime. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think that's what made it so devastating. Um, but having said that, you know what was. Like I think I think the thing that was most painful about it was the fact that he was right in doing what he did. You know, it wasn't 
it wasn't a case of like he was just being full of shit and something came up out of nowhere and he just decided to leave the team, um, which was what my emotions led me to believe uh, prior to the time or during the during the case. So, so yeah, I, I you know yeah, I even said so in the press release. I said that we, although we are hurt, we do feel that it was for the best because. Uh, I'm going to say certain heads were clicking or certain things needed to change and they weren't changing. So I do, I do think it was for the best. Do you feel that it was the right time though, given it's this far into the year and we've got some pretty big events coming up um, in the near future and in the next two or three months or so, do you think that the timing of it was right or, or should you rather have waited up until the end of the season at least? I definitely feel like the timing was not right. Um, we had two months or we have two months or just under two months ago before the three biggest events of the year. So I definitely feel like the timing wasn't right. But um you know what, having said that, I'm I'm a firm believer of if someone doesn't want to be somewhere, you shouldn't force them to stay there. Um, so even even if we could have stayed and tried to fix things, who knows, it could have worked. But I, I firmly believe that everything happens for a reason. Um, so, yeah, I suppose in hindsight, maybe it was a good thing because with regards to our new roster, the guys are really putting in a ridiculous amount of time. We've we've uh, we've adapted a hell of a lot, and um, the guys are really really powered up. So I do think that we've got enough time, 100%, definitely, um, to even do better than what we did with the previous team. Uh, if it was sort of three weeks to a month ago, I think we would have been quite high and dry in the water. But uh, but yeah, I think we'll be fine. All right, so um. Let's then talk about the new roster. You've added Rick Esclure, also known as Zip Zip, ZA, Richard Brown, known as Maniac, and Chris Davies, known as Crick, to the roster. And these guys are not what you would call new blood in particular. So they haven't joined the scene only in the last couple of weeks weeks they've got some good experience under the belt and they're certainly very talented players um i think the first thing that came to mind when i viewed the new roster was looking at sub sub ZA because he's a guy that's played for berserk gaming he's played for flipside he's played for ventus and now he's playing for you guys do you have confidence in his commitment to a team? Do you feel like you're adding him to the team, you're starting something good, he's going to be there, he's going to persevere in the next couple of months and stay with you guys and have that commitment to a team that's longer than just a couple of months? I 100% uh, back him and his ability to commit. Um, he has he's been in a couple of different teams. Uh, he started out the same time that uh, the rest of the guys, uh, Viking, Johan, and the old players, Carlo and N and them, started out. They all started out uh, in the CSC in about I think it was about four or five years ago, and he spent a great period of his serious career in Flipside. Um, let's just say uh, he he was uh, dealt a bad hand quite a couple of times with regards to roster changes in, in that team, and he always stuck it out. So um, I don't, uh, I, I definitely don't think that uh, Rickus is a player to necessarily just jump teams. Um, I think he just hadn't found the right team up until now. I think that that was very important. Um, another thing that needs to be mentioned is the fact that he's had an eye on Johan and the guys for a very, very long time, and we just never had the opportunity to make both sides meet um, in the past, you know. And again, I think this was a nice way and a fortunate way for us to get him because 
the minute this whole thing happened, the first person that we had our eyes on was Rikus because of firstly his ability and the fact that he's had top three and top four finishes in the past, um, his experience and just his, his all round attitude is absolutely fantastic. So it was it was a great uh, benefit for us to to bring him in. Well, we certainly hope that he sticks it out with you guys, and then he that he's uh, found a home that's going to benefit not only himself but you as a team as well. I mean, looking at Maniac and and Craig, they're also pretty solid guys, and you know, not as much around them to discuss as Sip Sip said. A eh? um, let's can talk about into them. okay. Uh, we'll if we'll do that in a minute. Okay. Sure. So before we go into uh, Crick and Maniac and, and a little bit of background on them and the breakdown on that, tell me when you found out that your players were leaving, I mean, anybody could imagine that it just has to be so gut-wrenching to think that you have to find new players and where would you find players that could integrate into your team? and have the skill. How did you go about finding these three new guys? I think it's I think it's a very it's a very difficult process, especially in the esports scene, because you know at the end of the day you kind of have no other choice but to, in a sense, sort of backstab other organizations, as as harsh as the word sounds. Um, you know, you you've got to look for new players, and you're not exactly going to look for um, sort of players that are playing in far lower divisions or players that don't have teams. You need players that have a good a good skill set as well as good experience. So that's why I say you know it's 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 a difficult one because you've got to you've got to have a uh, not so nice conversation with other organizations um, do it the right way and say look well these these are the players that we're looking at so um, our our approach to the whole thing was Crick has known uh, Johan and uh, Chris for and myself for a very long time we uh, most of us come from the Call of Duty days and um, when when we needed to get three players, um, he was up there as one of the first guys that we were looking at, uh, purely because he's impressed me a few times online, um, as well as the fact that I know that his work ethic is very high and he is a diehard ecstasy fan. Um, so with the exception of the other two, Crick was sort of the easier one to get in because he wasn't in any of the top masters teams. He wasn't contracted to any, uh, he wasn't held by any contracts or anything like that. Um, so he was an easy one. When it came to Zip Zip and Maniac, um, uh, obviously it was a bit more difficult because they were both in Ventus and they both were contracted to Ventus. Um, so we, we asked the, uh, a couple of people in the community, as one always does, um, those that have played with certain players, um, sort of what are they like? Because, you know, if you see someone in the community and you think, well, that's a solid player, he does well online, he does well on LAN, seems like a nice guy whenever you chat to him, is very nice. It's it's still a very different thing to when you play with that player in your team. So, you know, we sort of needed to get some information as to how are they actually, when they're in game, are they... Do they sort of tilt or are they um, very communicative and so on and so forth? So once we got the information, um, we pretty much just uh, spoke to Cyrus and we came to an agreement and yeah, we, we got our players. You know, it, it's kind of, um, how do I put this, surprising that the process was so seamless you could say because obviously you know if if you're familiar with what's been going on in the community in the last couple of months th there's been a lot of of talk around ventus and their players and players you know trying to get out of the contracts and the the contract in particular and so on so how did you guys manage to get these players without going through the whole drama. What is your experience in working with Cyrus to acquire these players? 
Um, look, I didn't deal with Cyrus myself. Um, the owner of XSC, uh, Park dealt with him because uh, he's got a, a good relationship with most of the, the owners of the MGO. Um, but but dealing with Cyrus, you know, I know there's a lot that's been said uh, in the past and obviously uh, due to valid reason. Um, but what I can say was when we had uh, a discussion with regards to taking the players across, you know, he handled himself very amicably and uh, we sort of formed an agreement. And as you say, it was very seamless. I think we it took us two days to get the players across for a day to get the players across and everything was fine from there. So, you know, again, it's sort of it's you 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 only know as much as what you hear in the scene with regards to players and this one having this issue especially i i'm well aware of what happened in the past with with players and their contracts and stuff like that um i i, I definitely think that it's a two-way streak uh, but I also in that given uh, situation i know that it was more than just not releasing the players i know there were issues like uh, peripherals and stuff like that and it was it was a whole gray area uh, which did turn quite nasty, but you know, I'm not, I'm not here to talk about Ventus. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think um, 100% agree with you. It is a two-way street, and I think it also speaks to the professionalism that we've seen from Ecstasy in the past how many years. For those who don't know, Ecstasy is a legacy organization. As far as I know, they were founded in 1999. So it's been like 18 years of gaming and you guys have always carried yourself very well. So kudos for getting those players across and being able to play with them. And then kind of carrying on from this, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you, you can give us a little bit of background on or just a little breakdown on, on Maniac and Cricket. I think this would be very interesting for the listeners to know as well. Yeah, look, uh, as I said before, uh, Crick, uh, Crick, we, we've known each other for, or when I say we, I mean he's known Johan and Chris for a very long time. Um, I've known him sort of through the industry uh, on and off. Um, he, like the rest of the original team, uh, also comes from a Call of Duty background. And the first time that I saw Crick play on LAN, I believe it was two years ago at Rage, uh, he was playing for the Ventus Academy side. And they actually beat their main side. And uh, I paid quite a bit of interest to him just because I'd sort of known him as an acquaintance in the past. And he had really impressed me. Um, take it two years later, and uh, he, was, he, he appeared at the Metal State LAN. Um, unfortunately, that was uh, <laughs> with the team that had the issues, uh, as well as um, yeah, I, th- I think there was a the the sort of factors regarding the release of players from Ventus, shall we just call it that, um, was also around that time. Um, obviously, due to that, the winnings being the issue there, and I think the team in general just struggled to sort of perform. Um, so I didn't really take that LAN into account. And then um, the most recent LAN that we had now was the VS Gay. No, sorry, I lied. It was the ESWC qualifiers in Joburg. And he was uh, substituting for a team by the name of Online Kingdom. Um, we actually played against a game against him. And he almost 40 bombed us despite us winning. So that that just reassured my, my uh, hope in him and, and my understanding of of his ability to do well on land um, but other than that you know he hasn't really he's never been in a masters team well yes yeah yeah no, he's never been in a masters team per se and not 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 many people really know him that well and i think that's what i like most about him you know um, i definitely think that he's got a lot of talent and with his work ethic he's definitely got the ability to upset people and make a good name for himself. And I think the reason why I went for him was the hunger and work ethic behind him wanting to improve himself. Uh, With regards to Richard Maniac, um, he has been in the scene since 1.6 days. Uh, He's quite an old school player. Um, He took a leave of absence, I think it was for about four years, somewhere around there, uh, finished his studies, 
And then I think he came back into the competitive scene about three years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, I, can't, I think he played for Altitude back then. Uh, I, I beg to, to uh, what's the word? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, shall we say. Um, where they came, I think, third or fourth at that land. And yeah, he's also been around to a couple of different teams. Uh, he played for Flipside as well. Uh, and then he went to Ventus. I'm not sure he might have played for one or other two teams in between. Um, but he's 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 always been known as an in-game leader. Um, and he's got a very, very high sense of work ethic. And he fits into a team very well. Uh, he really does, even from the little that we've seen of him so far. And I think a big decision for us as to why we decided to go for him was the fact that he will work really well with Johan in terms of... Uh, controlling the team and working well together and structuring practices and, and making sure everything goes according to plan. Sort of like a, a, a second leader in a sense. Um, that one's off record. It's, yes. uh, but, but I mean, that was one of the reasons why we took him. You know, he's also had uh, third and fourth place experiences in the past with a lot of different teams. Um, he's the oldest guy in the team. Uh, I believe he's 26. And um, yeah, he, he brings he brings a nice sort of uh, balance to the team. You know, we've got both Rickus and Richard that's come in now, and they sort of the the experience of the team along with Chris and Johan. I think we've got a very nice level of experience. Um, the new guys handle uh, pressure situations very well, which is also something that's uh, I feel that we've sort of lacked in the past. Um, and as I say, you know, Crick sort of our wild card who we definitely feel can perform very, very well. Uh, and he's got a nice attitude towards him. So that also really, really helps. Okay. So uh, something else that I was wondering about is I know many years ago when I was still on a Garza committee, um, which became Telcom Do Gaming, which became DJL which became VS Gaming, they've always had a rule that not many people spoke about or had even known about, that if you had five players in a team, you had to retain at least three of those players to keep whatever ranking or spot you have in the division that you are. So does this, your three players, do you know or do you think that this is going to affect your your spots, wherever you are, your ranking uh, with VS Gaming, or have you confirmed that you guys are still good to go? Um, I, I can't really sort of get into too much information around certain leagues, um, but what I can say is the nice thing about esports in general and how especially the counter-strike community is growing is the fact that especially you know when we were in call of duty days um obviously it was a very very big scene as what there is uh, now in counter-strike players just used to sort of develop attitudes do well and like have something that sort of doesn't go their way or it's a dispute with another player or an organization or whatever the case may be and as you say you know they up and leave and they decide no they're gonna take the team with them or take a couple of players with them and then they regain the spot. Um, what's nice is the fact that uh, firstly, a couple of these organizations that are out are actually um, built by players, um, players that have a good history with regards to the organization and the community so they understand how things work. Um, those as well as the big events sort of like uh, ESL and VS Gaming and stuff like that that have been around for a very long time, they also know what the industry is like when it comes to those situations. So what they've gone and done is they've changed the ruling. Well, let's just keep that uh, off the records because, again, I, don't, I can't uh, sort of give that, if that makes sense, because I, I could be – well, let me put it this way. I have contacted – all of the organizations barring um, VS Gaming, and I'll get into that one now, and all of them have given me their word that it is MGO-based. So why I say that is because I didn't necessarily read it in the rule books, but to my understanding with all of the leagues, they are MGO-based. 
Um, I think the only way that it wouldn't be MGO based is if the MGO were not able to field a team or if they, uh, well, yeah, in hindsight, it would be the same thing as not fielding a team. So with regards to us, um, it was definitely one of the things that I had to factor in right at the start. Um, I spoke to all of the organizations barring uh, VS Gaming and uh, definitely made sure that we keep it because at the end of the day, what both of them have said to me was, you know, we get into the tournament with the organization, not with the players, because players, as I've said in the past, you know, do tend to up and leave for whatever reasons. However, having said that, you know, obviously we were in very good terms with Carlo Aiden and them. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the case. I just honestly feel that they wanted to start their own thing and and see how far that they can get. So it wasn't it wasn't a, a case of they just up and left and you know sort of left yeah but yeah to answer your question it, it a lot of the organizations are going more based on the mgo because it also sort of tightens players wanting to just leave knowing that they're not going to get anything out of it if they do that is very very true and i think that i won't really get into that whole rule thing right now because from past experiences it can get quite extensive and there's a lot of debate yeah. around that so i think let's move back yeah. to the current team so you've now added these players to the team it's still very new you guys are still in the honeymoon phase but you have played some competitive matches together outside of just scrimming or practicing and so on so the first yeah. that you played was against wrg and Sorry. you played some great games you won 2-0 you performed really well. For me, it was something that doesn't happen all too often. There was a synergy, a natural synergy that happened that is very hard to achieve with new players. How did you guys feel after that win about the decision that you had made to add these three players into your lineup? I feel um, I feel we're very confident. Um, you know, it was. Uh, uh, I'd like to say that both myself and Mark, uh, the owner, as well as possibly Johan, had uh, a few sleepless nights uh, during the process for that exact reason. Because, like I've said to you in the past, you know, we didn't just want to get players to come across to fill a team so that we can get a good result. We wanted to get players that. You know, ecstasy would benefit them and their career as well as they would benefit us as ecstasy. Um, in terms of making sure that we get players that gel well together, that want to be here. And I think the most important thing that we looked for was players that are hungry and have strong work ethic. So why I say that is because when it came to the WRG game, uh, it was obviously our first game as a team together. Uh, the morale was high. And, you know, people, when, when you've got people that are hungry and have a high work ethic, they want to win. And they do whatever they can to win um, rather than sort of filling their minds with doubt, if that makes sense. So after that game, we were very happy, very, very happy with the guys. And then hot off the WRG game, you guys went into the game with DC and Ecstasy and DC have now faced each other <laughs> so many yeah. times. At, like you can't even, I can't even it's count like it. Tacky. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like kind of one of those um, legacy clashes. You know, people always think, you know, either DC versus Bravado or DC versus Energy and so on. But DC versus Ecstasy has also been a matchup that we've seen so many times in the past. And a lot of the times you guys win, a lot of times they win, and it's this ongoing battle. And so you went up against them with your new roster. And it was on the 10th of August, and your first map was quite insane. I would yeah. say that it was a colossal battle and given that you had a fresh roster and you haven't had a lot of experience competing together, it wasn't just a matter of 
you guys being ruffle stomped by DC. You fought hard and you fought for every round that you got. The second round, unfortunately, did not go the same as the first map, obviously. Um, the score on that one was 16-8 to DC. So, so take us um, through the feelings that, that the organization as a whole, not just the team, but the organization as a whole have when you're looking at a historical matchup such as this that's happened so many times and the battle that you had on the first map, which was on Cobblestone versus the game that you had on Mirage. I think um, for us, um, firstly, as an organization, we we uh, we like to think of ourselves as a a very clinical top team. So uh, I think <clears throat> we were a bit disappointed with the loss. Um, but you know, as you said, given the amount of time that we had, um, we'd only been together for three days uh, prior to the map or to that game. Um, you, you can never really be happy with a loss, if that makes sense. But um, we were we were proud of of our performances. Um, going into the Cobble game, we uh, it, it's actually the first and only map that we had practiced together as a team. Um, we've decided to break everything up. As I said, you know the guys have got a lot of time and effort that they're putting into it. And what we're doing is we're breaking up map by map. So that was actually the only map that we had practiced as a team so far. And we were very, very disappointed to not take that win. Uh, I believe at one point we were up 14-10 or 14-11, and we honestly thought we had it. Um, I feel like a few weak moments in, in judgment uh, led to costing us that game. Um, but like you said, you know, we've only been together for a couple of days. Uh, I think it was a great performance considering uh, the amount of time spent together and uh, onwards and upwards. Um, as I said, going uh, not, not really too much to talk about with regards to the Mirage game, having the fact that we had only practiced uh, a cobble. Um, and I think the guys were sort of, I, I wouldn't say they were down, but... Um, they, they were really expecting that win on Cobble. Um, so going into Mirage, we, to be honest, we really hadn't had much time to practice or, or go over any defaults or anything of the sorts. So we we weren't, I don't want to say we weren't expecting to win it, but um, we, we weren't as upset in losing it because we hadn't had any time prepped for it. So as a whole, with the organization, we were, we were very happy with the guys' performances. Um, but obviously everybody wants to win at the end of the day. And uh, they've definitely gone back hard to the drawing board and preparing for the next couple of games to come along. So would you say that your loss on Mirage is more attributed to the lack of experience as a team and, and the lack of practice that you've had on it rather than losing the first match and your morale going down? Yeah, no, I definitely think so. I mean, like I said, you know, we've we've been together as a team for three days, and considering DC are Titans that have been sort of a top three, top four team for 15, 16, 17 years, and they are still doing really well at this point. Um, considering that we took them 17, 15, or 18, 15 on the only map that we've practiced thus far, I do feel that if we had put in a couple of days into Mirage, we would have taken them on that map as well. So I definitely feel that. Okay, that, that kind of uh, clears it up for me. I, I think the reason why I specifically asked that question is because I feel that the viewers and the supporters um, might not have the insight as to why oh, things turned out. Perfect, as a, yeah. Exactly. So I just wanted to uh, clear that up a little bit. And then... Going forward, I mean, what is your confidence and, and your feeling uh, for the team? Do you think that if you have a couple of more months together and, and experience and practicing together and playing online as well as online, do you think that you could possibly 
contest the top two spots within the CSGO rankings at the moment? Do you think that you could surpass damage control and then challenge energy and challenge bravado for the top spot within the next couple of months? Or do you think that you might need a little bit more time, a little bit more than that, let's say give it a year before you are at the top in the number one spot? I think I think preparation is most important um, in any field of any type of sport. And I feel, you know, if you've got, let's say, 50 hours a week that you can put in, or 50 hours, so, yeah, 50 hours a week, um, just using it as a, a rough example, uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily determine if you can win or lose a game. It's more important as to how you apply that time. So... You know, we do only have seven weeks uh, leading up to this event, but I feel that the way that we are going about practicing um, and putting time in, considering this is only our second week, I do feel that the guys are very hungry. They're very, very motivated. They are putting in a lot of time and they're putting it into the right places. We've got one or two things up our sleeve that... uh, I think it needs a bit more time to see if it if if it is helping us, and uh, of which we will come out of that at a later stage. Um, but I do I do feel that we can definitely contest with the guys uh, heading up to the next two three events. I know it's a short period of time, but this is why I say it's it's really important as to how you are spending that time, because if you're spending it the right way, I mean you can take a team like a Big Five. Um, as well as uh, Goliath, for example. Also two teams that haven't necessarily been together for too long, but they, they're really getting some good results out there. So I think it just goes to show that if you're practicing and you're putting your, your, the right amount of time and effort into your practices, it really shows into your game. Um, and the most important thing of all is if you practice really properly and really well, it shows in your game. Because that confidence gets boosted a hell of a lot more than not being sure of certain situations. So, so yeah, to answer your question, I definitely do think that uh, we will be a top team to contend with in the next two months. All right. So, without giving away those uh, two or three things up your sleeve and, and too many of the <laughs> trade secrets, uh, if if you could give advice to the up-and-coming CSGO teams, not necessarily only within the top premier divisions, but the more novice divisions as well. If you could give them some knowledge drop, a quick one, on how to improve, not just like spend a lot of time and work hard and stuff like that. Uh, let's, let's say a little bit more specific, like playing, for example, playing scrims against other teams and so on. If you could give them something to empower them and to help them improve what would that be i think i think uh obviously things like uh, working on your aim as a given is very important um but just i think it's very important to firstly watch your own demos when you play so that you can see firsthand the mistakes that you make uh, it's also important to watch the international scene a lot so that you can understand the way that they think and the type of plays that they make. And another thing that a lot of teams, I feel, don't put enough time on is being able to understand and use utility on every map. Um, it's it's something that you you often see, especially in the local scene, people make mistakes. You know, they throw a smoke, they leave a hole, they throw a molly, it doesn't land in the right spot, their pop flashes don't work properly. And I think if you can master those three things, it's uh, it's it's very imperative to you becoming a better player. And um, yeah, just just keep your head down and and keep keep grafting. I think it's very very important. All very good. Pointers, I would say. Um, I think we'll we'll wrap it up um, in a bit. Is there anything that you would like to say from your team side, from your organisation side? Any sponsors you'd like to give a shout out to? Any random fans? Hello, mom. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I'd definitely like to say thank you very much to our sponsors, uh, Red Dragon, Ballistics, Syntec, and Crucial. Um, they've been absolutely fantastic to us uh, over the past three years, four years. 
and um, we we really do appreciate their continued support. They've uh, been detrimental to helping us set up things like boot camps and giving us fantastic uh, peripherals. So big shout out and big thank you to them. And then just to the fans of Ecstasy as well, you know, you guys have been with us for a very, very long time. Uh, we just like to thank you for your support and uh, continue to support us with this new fiery team that we have. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, it's certainly been very informative to uh, have this conversation with you. And I'm hoping that we'll hear a lot more from Ecstasy, that we'll see you guys fighting and bringing that fire that you have for so many years and getting back up there, giving the top two spots a run for their money. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. That's awesome.